word. Father, we thank you for uh, the correction and the instruction in righteousness that it gives to us. Father, we pray that uh, uh, this study this morning might be that which would uh, tend to draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we be conformed uh, to his image. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, last week we finished up the chapter 13. And uh, this week, of course, we find ourselves in chapter 14 of uh, Revelation. In this particular chapter, we're going to see seven uh, mid-trib announcements. Now, um, and recall our, the layout of the tribulation period. Uh, you start out, uh, the triggering event that begins the seven years of tribulation is this covenant that the Antichrist makes with Israel for a period of seven years. That kicks off. That's the beginning point. Once again, it's not a rapture that begins the tribulation. It is this peace agreement, this covenant. Then, of course, things will progress on for a period of three and a half years. And during the first three and a half years, you're going to see the one world church that will be brought into existence uh, by that point in time that will be killing those that come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ as a result of the witness of the 144,000. Those that will come to faith after the rapture of the church that God will seal on their foreheads uh, and is sealed for their protection and for their authentic, uh, to authenticate them as being from Almighty God. So they are protected. They will go out at that point and they will uh, minister the gospel to those uh, in the tribulation period. And by the way, the gospel that they uh, are presenting at that point is called the gospel of the kingdom. That's not the same as the gospel that we uh, uh, relate to today. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as we know it, coupled with the, the truth that the kingdom is about to be established. Okay? John the Baptist started off with that gospel of the kingdom. Jesus Christ presented the gospel of the kingdom. We do not present the gospel of the kingdom right now. Why? Because if you go to Matthew 21, 43, the kingdom, the literal kingdom was withdrawn, okay? And it will not be reinstituted until uh, a point in the future. So it is after the rapture of the church, they revert to preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which is the gospel that you and I know, coupled with the fact that the kingdom is about to be established. Why? Because it's only seven years away from uh, the beginning of the tribulation period. The literal earthly reign of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, and then, of course, we hit all of these different things that will happen at the midpoint of the tribulation period. One of which, goes, of course, is this abomination of desolation. And that's the sign given to the Jews. For those that know and understand what's written in the book of Revelation... They are to know they will have two revealings of the identity of the Antichrist. The first one is for those that know and understand the book of Revelation. They will know that this individual that makes this seven-year peace covenant with Israel, that's a sign. He is the Antichrist. And for a few of them, they will know and understand he's the guy. He's the Antichrist. And then the second sign, of course, is going to be for that generation, for those that see this individual go into the Holy of Holies, in the third temple that one day shall be built and they will see this individual go in and uh, demand that the world worship him claiming that he himself is God. Okay? That's part one of the abomination of desolation. Part two of that is where he constructs this huge image of himself and places that in the Holy of Holies and demands that the world worship that. So those are the two clues that future generation of specifically Jews and others that will know of this truth written in the book of Revelation, how they can conclude, yes, this guy is the Antichrist. Okay? So it's a wake-up call uh, for them. So and then uh, we'll progress right through. And remember, the first half of the tribulation, we will have already seen the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. And it is not until after the midpoint of the tribulation period these bold judgments that we'll talk about when we get into chapter 16 will actually kick in. So, with that as kind of a background, let's uh, go to 
verse 1, chapter 14. Uh, in this chapter, we have seven mid-tribulation announcements uh, before we come into the final series of judgments that we'll see in chapter 15 and 16. Verse 1. And I saw and behold a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. And let me just back up here and say, what we're having now is a vision uh, we're looking forward past the tribulation period. It's as if it has already come to an end, and we're now in the millennial kingdom. Okay, And what he's going to do is use this as a word of encouragement uh, for those Jews living at that point in time. Hey, guess what? The Antichrist, he's not going to be successful in, in killing off uh, all Jews and all Christians at that point. We're going to show show you, for example, these 144,000 that God specially sealed, they are still there alive. And we're seeing them now in this verse uh, uh, before the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. So this is an assurance to the Jews at that point in time. All of them are not killed by the Antichrist. And if you recall one of the previous chapters we looked at, where the question was asked, the very last uh, verse of a particular chapter, asked this question, who is able to stand? Okay? In other words, is everybody going to be killed? All Christians and Jews going to be killed? The answer is no. And here's one of the answers right here. Those seals, uh, they are able to stand. They're able to stand uh, up. They will not be killed by the Antichrist. And they are able to stand before the Lamb of God. And I heard the voice from heaven, uh, verse 2, as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. And the voice which I heard was as the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And he sing as it were a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn the song except the 144,000, even they that had been purchased out of the earth. These are they that were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they that follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were purchased from among men to be the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no lie. They are without blemish. This chapter makes two key points. First, it looks forward to the results of the bold judgments, uh, then the, the last series of judgments. And then secondly, we're going to see the words of comfort to the tribulation saints. They are not all going to be killed, uh, killed off by the Antichrist. So that verse 1, that is a millennial uh, messianic kingdom scene there, uh, in which we see the 144,000 standing before the Lamb on Mount Zion, which is there in uh, Jerusalem. And then we're given the reason for it. The key point of chapters 12 and 13 was Satan's war against the Jews. And in chapter 12, Satan sets out his campaign to destroy the Jews once and for all. And in chapter 13, he gives us the two men that he will use to carry out that program. That is, the Antichrist and the false prophet. So up to this time, remember in chapter 11, we saw the two witnesses that God allowed uh, to, to come on the scene uh, to bring people to faith. And then, of course, we see the two uh, witnesses, if you will, of, uh, of Satan. That is, the Antichrist and the false prophet. One of the first announcement of the seven announcements is this. The fact that the 144,000 are still living when the kingdom begins shows that Satan's program of Jewish destruction is going to fail. And uh, it will not succeed. He will not succeed in uh, killing off all the Jews. And of course, the other guarantee passage that we have is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and along about verse 36. Uh, the prophets tell us the only way people can kill all the Jews is if they can get rid of the sun, get rid of the moon, and get rid of all the stars of heaven. Then and only then will they be able to kill all Jews on the face of this earth. So that's God's tongue-in-cheek way of saying it's not going to happen. <laughs> 
I mean, you just spread the word, I guess, to all the Muslim nations around Israel that, uh, hey, you may want to do it, but uh, there's no way you will ever be successful in, in uh, taking out all the Jews. Uh, now, verses 4 and 5, there's a description of these men. First, they're called virgins. Well, what does that mean? In this context, these virgins, they are unmarried. Why? Because these individuals, because of the importance of their duty that they're going to be called to do to preach the gospel during this uh, seven-year period of time, they will not be married. In other words, they won't have family ties that would uh, uh, necessitate their being at home with their wife or with their kids to protect them and so forth. They're free to move around to preach and uh, so forth. So they're, they're called virgins there because they are unmarried. You refer to them as men, and since they're representative of the 12 tribes, the most likely they're all going to be men in that 140. They're all men. They are all men. They are all men. Mm-hmm. Uh, and second, they follow Christ. Third, they are redeemed. And fourth, they're called first fruits. I remember earlier when we talked about first fruits, uh, remember what we talked about. First fruits uh, in the scenario of a field that's, that's ripe. You know, they would go in and they would get, get, gather a handful of the grain, and that became a wave offering for the, uh, in, uh, by the priest in the temple there. And it always signified that uh, you know this harvest belongs to God, and it will be followed by a major in gathering. Okay, because after the first fruits, then they would go into the field and they would harvest the main part of it. Well, these are called the 144,000 are called first fruits in this context. Why? Because they are the handful. They're representative of the handful that will come to faith after the rapture of the church in the context of the tribulation period. Why? Because they're the very first that will come to faith, and they're the ones that will go out and disseminate the message of the gospel, and guess what the results are going to be? Well, we've already seen it in chapter 7. An innumerable company will come to faith as a direct result of their witness, and that's the major harvest. So these 144,000, they're viewed as being uh, the first fruits of the tribulation harvest. Okay? All right. First fruits, I've already given you most of that. Verses 6 and 7, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having eternal good tidings to proclaim unto them that dwell on the earth, and unto every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a great voice, Fear God and give Him glory. Now, as opposed to giving glory to uh, this image or to the Antichrist. Okay? Give glory to Almighty God. For the hour of His judgment has come and we worship Him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. This is looking forward to the judgments that are going to come in the last half of the tribulation period. Those last three and a half years. So, in fact, uh, another key thing that hit me, you know, you can study the book of Revelation over and over, and many new truths will hit you from time to time. Here's the one that hit me most recently uh, with this particular passage. Fear God, give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment is come. What is that telling you? Here's what it's telling you. The bold judgments, remember the judgments, three sets of judgments. You've got the sealed judgments come first and then the trumpet judgments, and then the bold judgments. The bold judgments are associated with the wrath of God. Okay? The wrath of God the Father. Bold judgments are associated with the wrath of God the Father. Remember what we saw in an earlier passage concerning the sealed judgments. The sealed judgments were associated with the wrath of whom? The wrath of the Lamb. Okay? So the seal judgments are associated with the wrath of the Lamb. That's chapter 6. And we see the bold judgments are associated with the wrath of God. The wrath of God the Father. So, is there any kind of a parallel we can see now with the trumpet judgments? Is there in any way uh, how we can say that they are parallel with the wrath of the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit involved in any way with the trumpet judgments. And I would submit to you, if you recall back what we studied 
with the first woe, the second woe judgment, and then the third woe, which would be the set of the bold judgment. Remember the fifth and the sixth trumpet judgments? Remember what those woe judgments were? And if you look back, what you're going to see is those demonic spirits, okay, that are released from the abyss. And then you're going to see, and for five months, they're going to be able to go out and to steam and to bring pain upon people, but they're prohibited from killing. And then the very next judgment, that uh, the second woe judgment, or that trumpet judgment, that is going to be where the demonic spirits, how many of them are released? Do you remember the number? 200 million of those demonic spirits are released, and that's the second woe judgment. And what do they do? They go out and kill one-third of the people. So I'd submit to you there is an association there with spirits, okay? Those are the demonic spirits. And perhaps it could be, just speculation, that the Holy Spirit would be the one that would allow the, the releasing of, of those. So there's a definitive connection between the seal judgments as being the wrath of the Lamb, chapter 6. And here we're going to see, well, when we get into chapter uh, 16, we're going to see those bold judgments, and they're going to begin, and they're very definitively called the wrath of God. Okay? So, uh, there may be a connection between the Trinity and these three particular judgments. The wrath of each one of these could, in fact, be involved here. So, fear God, give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment has come. Speaking of those bold judgments, the very last of the set of three. And worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So this is a proclamation of judgment. And this is a final call of grace to the world for the eternal good tidings. The eternal uh, gospel is proclaimed from mid-heaven to the world. This is the final call of salvation to the world. Now, keep in mind, during the tribulation period, we will have heard three sources of the preaching of the gospel. The first source is by the 144,000 that go out and minister worldwide. And then, of course, uh, the second is going to be those two witnesses that we saw in chapter 11. And then, now, we have the third and final witness from God, which is this angel. And very specifically, it tells us he goes around the world, okay? And he preaches every people group, every nation, uh, every tribe, every tongue is going to hear. So... Is there any room for anyone to say, well, I never heard the gospel during the tribulation period? Not at all. And only those people that will take the mark, I mean, everyone that takes the mark of the beast, they will have consciously rejected all three of these witnesses, okay? They consciously reject those three, and they consciously uh, uh, will take the mark of the beast and will consciously worship him. So, my point being, once again, no one takes that mark by accident. Okay? It's not because it's on the credit card with 666 or anything like that. It is a conscious decision on the part of the individual uh, to take uh, the mark of the beast and to worship him. They have actively rejected the true message from Almighty God. Okay. The angel proclaims the everlasting gospel to the entire world. And this is the third source of witness to the world. Uh, okay, verse 8. And another second angel followed, saying, Follow on. Follow on is Babylon the Great, that hath made all the nations to drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <clears throat> Once again, it's a double fallen when it talks about Babylon. Why? Because this is the law. Well, I guess I've got this down here. Uh, the third proclamation is the fall of the city of Babylon. And, of course, Babylon at that point would be the Antichrist's political capital. Remember, he's going to have two capitals. He's going to have a religious capital, and that's going to be in Jerusalem. And that's where he makes this abomination of desolation. When he goes into the Jewish temple, this is all about religion now there. That's his religious capital. It will be Jerusalem. He's trying to supersede uh, uh, what the Jews will have established there in that uh, particular uh, tabernacle or temple at that point. 
But then, of course, Babylon as the city will be his political or his economic capital. He's going to have two different capitals during this particular period of time. The double fall and fallen is uh, indicative that she receives a double portion of judgment in keeping with the law of the firstborn. The law of the firstborn. We've gone over this before. But just as a reminder, for those of you that may have forgotten, I doubt if anyone did, but for my own purpose, I'll, uh, I'll repeat it. The law of the firstborn. The firstborn gets a double portion. And the firstborn gets a double portion of blessing when they're in favor with God. The firstborn gets a double portion of judgment when they're out of favor or disobedient to Almighty God. Babylon is the firstborn of Satan because from that city, all of your false religions, uh, they spread from that point out. Okay, So Babylon as a city uh, is in fact the firstborn of Satan. And as Satan's firstborn, she will receive a double portion of judgment from Almighty God. And that's where we're going to see that Babylon as a city, the political and uh, economic capital of the Antichrist, is going to be absolutely destroyed. Destroyed so much to the point that, in fact, uh, it will not be inhabited by human beings again forever. Not even during the Millennial Kingdom. Two spots on the face of this earth are going to be the confinement spots for demons on the face of the earth during the Millennial Kingdom. One of those is the area of Babylon. Okay? Demonic spirits will be confined there for a thousand year period of time when Satan himself is locked up and chained and put in the abyss. So the other location is going to be Petra. Okay? They're in Edom. Uh, so both of those are going to be areas where demonic spirits will be confined during the, uh, the millennium, period of a thousand years. Okay. Uh, verse 9. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a great voice, If any man worshipeth the beast and his image, and receiveth the mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. In other words, he is going to experience these bold judgments that are going to be poured out. Uh, And once again, these are identified as being the wrath of God, okay? Uh, Which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger. What that means is this. When they made wine in the old days, uh, wine in its full strength, uh, but normally they would take the wine in its full strength and there were two different schools of thought there, and they were constantly battling back and forth. One would take the wine and mix it with three parts of water. The other group would take the wine and mix it with seven parts of water. Okay? And uh, the idea there being, if wine is mixed uh, with seven parts of water, you cannot drink enough of it to make you uh, drunk. Okay? Because... Okay. The water is is too much water in it uh, for it to uh, influence you in a negative way. So, uh, but it was called strong drink when it was not mixed with water. And so, what he's doing, he's taking that imagery now and applying this to uh, to the wrath. He shall drink of the the wine of the wrath of God, which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger. In other words, it's not going to be diluted. When God allows this, these particular judgments to come, it is an undiluted judgment. Okay, uh, And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. They that worship the beast and his image. And also, and whoso receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. They that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So, once again, this verse is a proof text for us. The point of no return for an individual today concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ is death. Past death, if a person has not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they cannot be saved, period. It's going to be a little different during this particular period of time. 
during the tribulation period, the person who has rejected all three of these witnesses that we've mentioned over and over now, they will have rejected those and taken the mark of the beast. At that point, they cannot be saved. And this is going to be given to us in another chapter of Revelation as well. They will have reached the point of no return uh, past which they cannot be saved if they take the mark of the beast and bow down and worship him. It will be a conscious decision, and they will not take that uh, accidentally. The fourth proclamation concerns those who do not take the mark of the beast in chapter 13. The whole world is given an option to own the Antichrist as God or to repudiate him and worship the true God. To own him as God is to take upon themselves. To own the Antichrist as God is to take upon themselves the mark of 666, <coughs> which is the number of his name. And as we've explained to you earlier, uh, really what that is, you take in Hebrew letters the name of the Antichrist and take each letter associated with that Hebrew uh, letter, and they will add up to the sum of 666. And for those of you that have the workbooks, of course, there's a chart, I think, an exhibit in the back that will give you the delineation of those. And it is not given so that you and I, so it is not given so that church age believers can know or will know the identity of the Antichrist. Okay? It is for those Jews, very specifically, during the tribulation period, so that they can confirm his identity once he comes on the scene. Okay, so they will have forfeited all opportunity to be saved when they take the mark. Uh, they will not have the opportunity from that point on to be saved. Two things are destined for them. First, to be the bold judgments. It is the line of the wrath of God uh, that we'll see in chapters 15 and 16. The second half of the Great Tribulation will be especially severe for those that take the mark. Secondly, they are destined for hell and the lake of fire forever. Once they take the mark, that is their destiny. They will not have an opportunity to be saved later. Verse 13. And I heard the voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, set the Spirit, uh, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow with them. Now, this verse contains the fifth proclamation that we're seeing in this chapter, and it concerns the martyrs of the second half of the Great Tribulation. Uh, these martyrs are given a special promise uh, of blessing, and it's those uh, who die for the Lord during the second half of the Great Tribulation because of the severity of their death. Remember what we said before. Believers and Jews that are killed during the first half of the Tribulation who is it that's doing the killing at that point? It is the church, that one world church that will be wrought into existence. It is not the Antichrist at that point. His mask does not come off until the midpoint of the tribulation period, and then his true intentions are revealed. So who is it? the second half that is responsible for killing the Jews and uh, Christians, those that come to faith? It is the Antichrist. He is the active agent to kill uh, Christians and Jews during the second half of the tribulation period. Verse 14, And I saw and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud I saw one sitting, like unto a son of man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the temple, crying with a great voice to him that sat on the cloud, Send forth thy sickle, and reap, for the hour to reap is come, for the harvest of the earth is right. And he that sat on the cloud cast his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. These verses give us the sixth proclamation of this chapter. Reaping is a symbol of salvation. Now, in just a minute, we're going to see reaping is a symbol of judgment. But the first initial reaping is that of salvation. It's like, uh, remember that Christ talked about the fields are white on the harvest? And how did they harvest? How did uh, Ruth harvest in Boaz's field? You know, he would go in and, and glean those corners with a sickle that would cut. So this first, don't be confused by this, but the first uh, uh, this, uh, imagery that we're given here of reaping is of salvation. And that tells us in spite of the massive following uh, the Antichrist will have, 
there will be people coming to Christ during the second half of the Great Tribulation, especially the whole nation of Israel at the very end of the Tribulation. Verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Now this is going to be a different harvest here. And another angel came out from the altar, he that had power over fire. And he called with a great voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Send forth thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel cast his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vintage of the earth, and cast it into the wine press, the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without the city. And there came out blood from the wine press, even under the bridles of the horses, as far as a thousand and six hundred furlongs, or sixteen hundred furlongs. Mm-hmm. One furlong is five hundred and eighty two feet. It's actually a literal one hundred and seventy two miles blood will flow. It is one hundred and seventy two miles from Megiddo, the gathering place of the armies of Armageddon, all the way down to Petra there in Edom. So blood that whole distance will flow. And up to the bridles of the horses, it's roughly four feet high. Uh, so it's going to be an absolute carnage of those who are actually at that point marching against the Jews that will have taken refuge in Petra, trying to annihilate them. So the seventh proclamation is out of the trading of the grapes. By the way, this is also the same imagery that we get in the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, 1 through 6, 1 through 3, uh, where the prophet Isaiah, standing there in Israel, he looks to the east, Jordan, and he sees this huge uh, uh, image of Jesus Christ coming with this white robe and its blood stained from top to bottom. And the imagery there is that he's been in the wine press there. Just as they would go and stomp on the grapes to get the juice out, and, uh, and it was splatter up on their garments, this is the same thing that uh, Isaiah sees in Jesus Christ after he has just annihilated the armies that we've talked about here of the Antichrist as they're marching down to destroy the Jews. So he views Jesus Christ. By the way, another proof text. Jesus Christ, where does he come to first in his second coming uh, his second coming to the earth? He comes back first to where his people have just called on him to come back there in Petra. He comes back there and he does his then he leads his people and does his victory ascent there in, to your Zechariah passage of the Mount of Olives. So he does come to the Mount of Olives but that's not the first place he comes to. The first thing he's going to do is deal with the armies of the Antichrist that are trying to annihilate his sheep that are in the sheep fold there of Petra. Okay. Verses 19 and 20, the city there is Jerusalem. The place of the wine press of the wrath of God is outside the city, which is the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is there in the eastern, uh, due east of the Temple Mount area. And uh, it's also the uh, Kidron Valley. And uh, so the blood will reach a distance of, it's commonly uh, put at 175 miles. Literally, it's 172. Uh, so that campaign of Armageddon will take place in that, that entire length, all the way from their gathering place, all the way down to uh, Petra. All right. That's the end of chapter 14. Any comments or questions on chapter 14? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, the three what? Okay, there are two reapings mentioned in this chapter. The very first reaping, this is a good reaping. This is a harvest of uh, people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. That's a good reaping, uh, symbolized by Christ also. Beautiful light on the harvest. Time to reap. But you and I are believer of the sweat and the souls in. That's the reaping. That's the good. But the second one is the judgment. Okay, that's the that's the bad reaping, and that reaping consists of these bold judgments that we're going to see when we get to chapter 16 very specifically. Okay, so those are the two reapings. Yes, Karen. 
says when it mentions the uh, bold judgment and being associated with God's Father, is that in chapter 16? Uh, we see it here, but we'll see it again as well. Uh, they're, they are the wrath of God, okay? Just like chapter 6 told us, uh, the seal judgments, they are the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, and my next question um, has, doesn't have anything to do with chapter 14, but previously when we were studying in chapter 13, the Antichrist and the false prophet, everyone, the focus is on the Antichrist. Can you speak just a little bit about the false prophet? Okay, the false prophet is, he's a counter, of course, to the Holy Spirit. And the function of the Holy Spirit today, He's the one that woos and draws and encourages people. His focus is to bring people to Jesus Christ. The same function is performed by the false prophet. The false prophet's function is to, in fact, focus people and bring them towards the answer Christ. Okay? It is a religious uh, function that he's, he's performing. It is to... Uh, and I don't know exactly what traits he'll use to do that. If Satan, I mean, perhaps all the uh, traits that Satan has, I mean, he may deceive them, use deceit and lies and so forth to encourage people to, to believe that this individual is God and he needs to be worshipped, the Antichrist. So he may be more spiritual. <coughs> he is, he is definitely. He's the spiritual uh, counterpart to the Holy Spirit. So you've got a complete uh, false uh, counterfeit trinity there. So he's the counterfeit uh, of the Holy Spirit. Leads and draws them, you know, instead of Jesus Christ, to the Antichrist. Uh, well, that may kind of tie to what I'm going to ask is, you speak of the one world church. What are they, who are they worshiping? What, world church. Whatever entity that they end up with, it may be Allah, it may be a combination of Allah, it, it may be a conglomeration of Allah and God with some coexistence agreement on all of their parts. But keep in mind what they will have done at that point. They will have totally watered down every true doctrine that you and I know that we call the fundamentals of the faith. They will have to throw out the window that Jesus Christ is God. They will have to throw out the window. And by the way, that's one of, go to 1 Timothy 4, 1. That is a doctrine of demons. They are the ones that propagate that particular teaching. Uh, and, you know, it, it's called apostasy. And, uh, right. and, of course, it's part of the last days. So they will throw out every one of the fundamentals of the faith in order to bring this amalgamation of doctrinal beliefs together and we see it happening in the world today uh, forgetting uh, these miracles in the Bible oh, you, you know you just you explain these away and then I'll explain away this explain away that we, you know Jonah swallowed by well give me a break man you know hey let me tell you what if God said that Jonah swallowed the well in the Bible I would believe it okay but uh <laughs> I'm glad a few of y'all caught that. <laughs> okay. But anyway, the One World Church, hey, it's going to be a conglomeration of uh, uh, false beliefs that sound good. By the way, there's a passage in John that says, those that kill you, will they will think that they are doing God service. And every time I read that, I think that's exactly a description of these, the radical Muslims that bomb themselves. What do they think? They're doing all our service. And, uh, and the glory they're going to receive for it, you know, they're going to go to their paradise and have all their little rewards. But boy, I'll tell you what, if you could just imagine the look on the face of an individual that has that picture painted for them, when they truly get to where they're going, there's going to be a totally different outlook on things. Okay. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Will people die during the thousand years? Yes, they will. Uh, number one of which, if you go to Isaiah 65, verse 20, he's going to tell you that unbelievers, children that are born, first off, enter into the millennial kingdom, only believers. That's one of the points in time at which 100% of the people on the face of this earth will be saved, okay? At the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Why? 
because at the end of the tribulation period, there's going to be a judgment. The sheep are separated from the goats. The wheat are separated from the tares. The tares, the unbelievers, they're taken out and burned. So only believers enter into the millennial kingdom. But the children that will be born during, during to those believing parents, they will have until the age of 100 to, put, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. If they don't, they are killed. Isaiah 65, 20. Judgment is rendered on those children at the age of 100. God gives them, that's their age of grace, okay? Anytime up to the age of 100, uh, you know, they will live. But uh, beyond that, uh, they, will, they, will be, they will be killed. Now, the question then becomes, well, could a believer die during the millennium? And I'm going to answer that this way. I think it is possible, yes, especially if an unbeliever uh, were to rise up and kill a believer, but because there is no uh, resurrection of, of believers at the end of the millennial kingdom, I've got to believe one of two things would happen. I've got to believe either Jesus Christ himself would raise that individual back to life as he did in his life and ministry on the face of this earth, or he would sanction one of the church age believers okay, that would be empowered to then go and to perform that particular miracle to raise that believer back up to life. Keep in mind at that point, we're in our, let's call it a super body, okay? Our eternal state, resurrected bodies, perfect in every respect, and we're ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, okay? So uh, so it, it's well within the realm of possibility that, uh, and because you may be given, you know, a position of authority over cities or nations or that kind of thing, people groups, uh, you may be the individual that would be sanctioned to then raise that individual believer that was killed wrongfully uh, back to life. I've got to believe one of those two things would happen. So yes, there is death definitely in the tribulation in the uh, millennial kingdom, uh, primarily you know, for unbelievers. And by the way, at the very end of the millennial kingdom, we'll talk about that when we get uh, a little further in the book. Uh, <coughs> Remember what's going to happen at the very end of the millennium kingdom. Uh, well, I lost my thought there. I was going to tell you something. Really. Really <coughs> the great battle. Okay, thank you. When Satan is released out of the bottomless pit and he musters this army that marches against Jesus Christ on the throne in Jerusalem, guess what his army consists of at that point? Unbelievers, unbelievers only, under the age of what? 100. 100. 100 or less, okay? Uh, because everyone, every unbeliever when they reach that age, hey, they'll be automatically killed. Okay, other comments or questions? All right. That brings us to chapter 15. <coughs> chapter 15 is a real short one. Uh, and it gives us the prelude to the bold judgments that we're going to see in 16. Each series of judgments was preceded by a prelude of events occurring in heaven. And uh, we have a lengthy prelude in relationship to the bold judgments. Why? Because they are drastic judgments. They're severe judgments. Verse 1, chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven plagues, which are the last, for in them is finished the wrath of God. Somebody was asking, do we see this again? It is the wrath of God. <coughs> chapter also. And very specifically, it is these seven last bold judgments, which is the third woe judgment. They are the wrath of God. And I submit to you that it's the wrath of God, the Father. Uh, a small distinction, but a distinct distinction between of that and the wrath of the Lamb, for example, uh, associated with those sealed judgments. And by the way, once again, that's another proof text for you that believers do not, church age believers, do not enter into the tribulation period. Why? We do not experience the wrath of God, uh, nor the wrath of the Lamb. And in fact, uh, as Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it's also. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 9. But that's also in your notes. Okay. 
same basic purpose was spelled out for the seventh trumpet, and that's why we need to see the seventh trumpet judgment containing the seven bold judgments. Because it is the bold judgments uh, that the wrath of God is brought to its completion. And God's purposes for the great tribulation reach their fulfillment. Now remember, we said before this, God has three primary reasons for bringing the entire tribulation period uh, into existence. What are they? Does anybody remember any of those three reasons? Why the tribulation period? What is it God's trying to accomplish? Trying to get everybody to come to faith. Number one, evangelize the whole world. And this was what God, one of the things God wanted the Jews to do in the Old Testament, but they never did. So evangelization, one reason. What's another one? For the Jews to be repentant. Yes, it is to break the stubborn will of the Jews. The verse literally reads, to break the power of the Jews. It is to break the stubborn will of the Jews in having rejected him, which they did when he came. And uh, the third one is to bring an end to wickedness. Okay? And he will deal with the wicked during this particular period of time. Okay, so all of those three things God will accomplish during the tribulation period. That's the purpose of the tribulation period. For God to accomplish those three things very specifically. Verse 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that come off victorious from the beast, and from his image, and from the number of his name, standing by the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. O Lord God, the Almighty righteous and true are thy ways thou king of the ages who shall not fear O Lord and glorify thy name for thou art holy for all the nations shall come and worship before thee for thy righteous acts have been made manifest so in these verses we have a group which are the saints of the second half of the tribulation and these verses record both their victory in that they refuse to take the mark of the beast and their song, which is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb in verses 3 and 4. So verses 3 and 4 actually contain the words for us of the song of the Lamb. But as to the song of Moses, it may be either reference given to us in uh, Exodus chapter 15 or the song of Deuteronomy chapter 32. The song of Moses could be either one of those. Either one of those. Uh, they were dealing, of course, with the, the song of victory, giving praise to Almighty God for their having been released and brought out of bondage there from uh, the Egyptians. 